Galatians 6, 6 through 10, those are the verses that we're going to be covering today. And some of you have read these verses. Uh, you've gone through this section before. This is nothing new to you. And I've, I've read these verses and gone through this section also. And it is amazing how much more you learn when you sit down and study these verses out. I've never actually studied these verses the way that I did uh, this past week. And oh, it's amazing how much there is here that I didn't see. We're just going to start at verse 6, and we're going to take each verse uh, one at a time. Verse 6 says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. The idea that a student should uh, share with his teachers, this principle is expressed uh, throughout Paul's letters. For example, uh, referring to elders who teach in the church, Paul in 1 Timothy 5.18 wrote, the laborer is worthy of his wages. And what Paul's saying here is, Teachers in the church should be compensated for their labor. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. I hesitated to even talk about this verse because I know what some people might think. You're telling us to give you more money. Wrong. It's not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I'm just telling you what Paul means because this is just what Paul taught. But by sharing his goods with his teacher, the student makes it possible for the teacher to spend less time on his secular work and more time studying for the benefit of the church. That's, that's I think, what Paul's saying here. Now, there's a broader meaning to this, and the broader meaning is what I want to focus on. Because I think the broader meaning is more important. The reason that Paul says this is because this is one way, and it's not the only way, but it's one way to sow to the Spirit. And by sowing, we're talking about farming. When you sow, you scatter seed on the field. So we're talking about sowing uh, kind of like that, but in a spiritual sense. I'll talk more about what that means here in a minute. But this is why Paul's saying this. Because every, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. And let me, let me explain a little bit um, about how all this happens because sometimes this can be confusing. I have um, I've talked to a lot of people about this subject and it seems like there's a lot of confusion, so I want to clear up some of the confusion. A person is saved by faith. You're saved by believing the gospel. And this is just taught everywhere in Scripture. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. In other words, a person is saved by believing in their heart that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. They believe that. And more specifically, they believe that because Jesus did that, all their guilt is washed away and God no longer looks at them as a sinner, but he looks at them as a forgiven child of God. And a person believes that. And they don't just believe it the way you believe that, you know, it's cold outside right now. We've talked about how cold it is outside and it is. But you, you believe it in your heart. And if you believe something in your heart, that belief in your heart moves you to live a certain way. Now, here's what happens. People, some people believe. They believe in their heart. Their heart has changed. They receive the Holy Spirit, but then they don't focus on walking in the Spirit. They lose sight of that. They lose sight of even what they're believing in. 
And so Paul is talking to people in the church that might have lost sight of that. That yes, you believed. And just by believing, you, you were saved. You, you were forgiven. You received the Holy Spirit. But they're not walking in the Spirit now. And we're required to walk in the Spirit. So Paul says, don't, don't think that you can just believe in the past and then not do anything with your spiritual life after that. You have to continue walking in the Spirit. And I've said this many times, I just want to say it again, just, just to remind you, to walk in the Spirit is basically to obey the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit, it means to live under the Spirit's influence, to live through His power. When God puts His Holy Spirit in us, the Spirit begins to move us, to use a biblical word, move us to follow God. The Spirit is influencing us so that we follow God and please God. And walking in the Spirit means that you are regularly, not perfectly, but you are regularly giving into that influence. You're living a life that is pleasing to the Holy Spirit. And some people, they get saved and they, they, they believe and they're just so excited. And then that fire begins to die down and they cease to walk in the Spirit. I will tell you the most dangerous time, I think, in the Christian's life. There, there, there's different stages of the Christian life. And you guys who have been saved for a while, you, you know this. But there's, there's like the, the time when you, you first get saved. You believe the gospel, you get saved. And then you enter the, I'll call it the honeymoon stage of the Christian life, where everything is good. I think God blesses new Christians with this, this stage to just let them know you really are saved. You're, you're changed. Your heart's changed. And so they... They enter this honeymoon stage where it's just everything is good. And they're excited to be a Christian. They're excited to follow God. And the most dangerous stage of the Christian life comes after that. And that is when the feelings start to be less. And real life starts to happen. And you realize not everything is good in the world. Not everything is good in my world. And then the person starts to maybe get distracted with things. And they start to maybe get focused on problems and they, whatever it is. And what happens is they gradually start to follow the Spirit less and less. That, I think, is the most dangerous period in the Christian life. It follows the honeymoon stage. And I believe that is when most people who turn away from God, that's when they do it. Actually, in the parable of the, of the sower, Jesus said that uh, there's some seed, it's, it's sown on soil, and the soil represents a person's heart. And what happens is that the, the person do, there, is, there is growth that takes place initially. The seed does, you know, it does kind of take root. But here's the problem. The worries and cares of this life choke it, making it unfruitful. And this happens so much where people really, people do believe, they do, they do get excited um, about Christ and, and they, they do start off good for a short time, but then life chokes that seed to death, chokes whatever, whatever, whatever little root there is, whatever started to grow, whatever it was, it's choked to death by the worries and cares of this life, and it, it eventually dies. Paul says, don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. In verse 7, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Paul's saying, Don't think that you can neglect 
the generosity mentioned earlier and be sowing to please the Spirit. In other words, don't think you can be walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit at the same time. You can't. Paul, Paul's still talking about the self-deception that he mentioned earlier in verse 3. In other words, Paul's saying this, don't deceive yourself about your own character. Don't deceive yourself about your own heart. Because we can, we can do that sometimes. Men must not deceive themselves about their character and imagine themselves to be spiritual or walking in the spirit when in reality they're walking in the flesh. And if you do this, this is called mocking God. God is mocked when a man professes faith in Christ and then lives his life in the flesh. That's mocking God, according to Paul. In, in Titus 1.16, Paul spoke of men who profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. People make all kinds of professions, and there are people that they profess Christ. They profess to be following Christ. They profess to be walking in the Spirit. But if you look at their life, it's very obvious sometimes that, that they're not. They're not walking in the Spirit. They're professing to, but their life doesn't show it. And here's, the, here's the, the kind of the bottom line of this. The bottom line is, if you're walking in the Spirit, it's going to be obvious that you are. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to look like you're walking in the Spirit. And if you're walking in the flesh, well, that's going to be evident too. Remember Paul said earlier in the chapter, there are deeds of the flesh and then there are fruit of the Spirit. There's different fruits of the Spirit. Paul says you can, you can know. You can know whether a person's walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit, you, you look at their life. And somehow, I don't know how this happened, but somehow, somehow in, our, our, in modern Christianity, it's like people are being told, well, you can, you can live any way you want to, but that's okay, God's still, God's still okay with you. And there's so much of an emphasis on, well, it's not how you live, it's what's in your heart. And I have to ask myself, is there a difference there? Like, can you have a good heart and live a bad life? Is there any such thing? What we're being told these days, oh yeah, it's, you can live evil and be good. Paul says, not a chance. Now, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm not saying that Christians never do anything wrong and we're just always doing the right thing and there's no sin that we have to deal with. That's not true either. But the idea is, if you're walking in the Holy Spirit, then you're going to live a spiritual, righteous life. If you're walking in the flesh, then you're going to live an unrighteous life. And how you know how you're living or how you know whether you're in the Spirit or not is you just look at your own life and you say, where am I at? What does my life look like? Am I, am I living a righteous life or is my life not righteous? And that's how you know where you're at spiritually. So many people, I've heard this, it's like they, they, they say things like, well, it's not how you live, it's what's in your heart. Well, here's what Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart shows through in your actions. You can, you can know somebody's heart, and sometimes people do act out of character. That's certainly true. Sometimes people live for a, for a while, for a season, in a way that's, that's inconsistent with, you know, what's going on in their heart. I mean, that, that does happen. We do live out of character sometimes. But the thing is, is how you live really determines your heart. That, that shows what's in your heart. The evidence that a man is walking in the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. And a, and a man may be able to fool others sometimes, but he can't fool God. God knows his true character because God knows the hearts of all men. This means God knows your heart. He knows my heart. Do you know your own heart? 
Now, this is maybe the most important verse in this section, and that's in verse 8. Paul says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, the flesh is likened to a field. And when the seed of wickedness has been sown in it, it'll reap a harvest of corruption. Now, there's a couple ways to understand Paul's words here. I'll tell you what I think it means. I think, I think Paul is probably referring to a man who, instead of using his wealth to help alleviate the burdens of others, he's using it to indulge his flesh. Remember, Paul's talking about... Um, well, here specifically, he's, he's talking about helping uh, or sharing with your teachers. And Paul's saying, you know, if, if, you're, if, you think, if you think that you're sowing to the Spirit, well, just look at how you're using your money. Are you using your money to help others or are you using it to indulge in the flesh, to indulge your flesh? The more he sows to the flesh, which just means the more he obeys the flesh, the more he serves the flesh, the more corruption he will reap. And notice where the corruption comes from. It doesn't come from God. It comes from his own flesh. In other words, whatever you feed, that, that's what gets stronger. Whatever you feed, whatever you're sowing to, produces a certain kind of harvest. Corruption of the soul is a natural consequence of sowing to one's flesh. This is, a, this is the natural consequence. In other words, when we sin and we become more corrupt, okay, that's not God making us more corrupt. That's our flesh making us more corrupt. It's the natural consequence of sowing to your flesh. If you obey the flesh, the flesh gets stronger and you get worse. If you obey the Spirit, the influence of the Spirit becomes stronger and you become a more righteous person. And it's just natural. This is the natural consequence of, of this way, of living this way. So it's not like God's making you worse. You're making you worse. Your flesh is making you worse. And to put it like this, this is, I think, the most simple way to say it. The more you sin, the worse you get. The more you walk in the Spirit, the better you get. I think it's, it's just, it's that simple. It's that simple. Whatever you're feeding is getting stronger. Not because God's making this or that happen, but because it's, that's just, that's a natural consequence. Now, I, I, I want to tell you this, though, because the question then is, well, when do you reap the harvest? And we're talking about a spiritual harvest here. If you sow to the Spirit, then when do you reap the harvest? If you sow to the flesh, when do you reap that harvest? Well, there's two ways of looking at this. And I, I think even if Paul's talking about only one kind of thing here, I think both of these outcomes are true. There's a sense in which whatever you're, whatever you're sowing to, you know, you kind of, you reap that harvest sort of in, in this life. It is true that you reap that harvest in this life. For example, if you sow to the flesh, you reap a harvest of corruption in this life. You become more corrupt in this life. If you sow to the spirit, you reap a harvest of righteousness and eternal life in this life. Because remember, eternal life begins when you get saved. Eternal life is a quality of life, among other things. And it's a quality of life that comes from walking in the Holy Spirit. And we experience eternal life right now. I think here, though, even though that's totally true, I think here the harvest that Paul has in mind is the harvest at the end of the age when Jesus comes back. I think that's primarily what Paul has in mind here. I hope this is making sense. 
So if this is true, and I think this is hinted at in Galatians 6, 9, I think this is a harvest at the end of the age and not so much a harvest in this life, although that's certainly true also. But if this is so, then Paul's referring to the corruption of the soul in hell. A person in hell will suffer the consequences of all the evil they've sown in this life. In other words, and I think Jesus is the one that said, and this is mentioned elsewhere, but I think Jesus said, if you are living according to the flesh, if you're letting your sin nature control your life, you are storing up the wrath of God for the day of judgment. You're storing it up. Okay, and Jesus said that, I think, to the Pharisees. You are storing up wrath if you are living according to the flesh. And on the day of judgment, all of that will be held against you. But if you're living according to the Spirit, then you are storing up a reward. And the reward generally is eternal life. And of course, we get Christians will be rewarded with more than just eternal life. But we have to sow to please the Spirit. We have to sow to the Spirit in order to reap eternal life in the life to come. I think that's the idea that Paul is, is uh, teaching here. Now, again, what does it mean to sow to the Spirit? It means living to please the Spirit by following his promptings and resisting the desires of the flesh. Notice Paul says in verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh will, will from the flesh reap corruption, but to the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So I think the meaning is this. The one who lives his life walking in the Spirit will reap eternal life, will inherit eternal life in the future. Now again, eternal life is mentioned in two different ways in the Bible. John 5, 24, Jesus said, he who believes has, present tense, has eternal life right now. The moment a person believes the gospel, that person starts to be, they begin experiencing eternal life. They begin experiencing this quality of life that comes from being in a relationship with God and having the Holy Spirit in your, in your life. That's eternal life. And that life, of course, will continue for all eternity as that person walks in the Spirit. But if a person walks in the flesh, that person will eventually reap corruption. They're, they're, they'll, they will suffer the corruption of their soul in hell. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. Scripture teaches that the faithful will receive eternal life in the age to come. So they, we have eternal life now, but there's a sense in which we will receive eternal life in the future. Let me give you an example. In Romans 2, 7, Paul wrote, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give them eternal life. That is, he will, the person will receive eternal life in the age to come. This is what Paul means here in Galatians 6, 8, I think. If a man is living to please the Spirit, that man will inherit eternal life. Or, as Paul said in Romans 8, 13, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will have eternal life. Now, I know that this is, this is something that is, I think, let me put it like this. If I were to give this message probably in whatever, whatever, in the average church. If I were to give this message in the average church, there are people who would shriek. And here's why. Because what they're told is, well, you just, you believe at a certain point in time, you believe you become a Christian, and you just automatically have eternal life from that point on, and you don't have to do anything else. It's just you believe and your, your, your eternity is fixed. I'm here to tell you, and I, 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 don't, 
I don't know how else to say it. That's wrong. It's just not true. Now, it is true when, when a person first believes. Yes, they do have eternal life at that moment. They do. But in order to have eternal life forever, they have to continue walking in the Spirit. And Paul doesn't say that one little one place in some obscure way. He says that everywhere. This is mentioned all over the Bible. Jesus said this. Paul said this. Peter said this. James said this. John said this. All of them did. All of them did. So yes, we believe and we, we were saved at that point. But, but we have to continue walking in the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's so easy for people to go, oh, I guess I am walking in the Spirit, I guess. You know, I guess I, I, I guess I am. I mean, I, you know, I go to church. I open my Bible once in, once in a while. I do read the Bible sometimes. Okay, but are you walking in the Spirit daily? Are you living in the Spirit? Are you living through the power of the Spirit? Are you doing that? Is your, is your life reflecting Christ? Are, are you becoming more like Christ all the time? Are you growing? Is your, is your hunger for righteousness growing? Are you doing the kinds of things that Jesus did? Are you living the way that Jesus lived? Paul says in verse 9, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now notice he says, in due time we will reap. This makes me think that the reaping happens at the end of the age when Jesus comes back. Then we will reap a harvest at that time. Again, do we reap things now? Of course we do. You know, do, do we... Do we grow in righteousness now? Of course we do. So again, the reaping that Paul's talking about here, I'm not saying it's limited to the end of the age when Jesus comes back, but I'm saying I think that's what Paul primarily has in mind in this, in this section. Paul says, by doing good. I think Paul means sowing to the Spirit in general. And again, this involves submitting to the influence of the Spirit and doing the things that he leads you to do. And we will eventually reap if we do not grow weary. What does this mean? Well, the words grow weary mean let, let completely out as to entirely succumb, that is, with the outcome of losing inner strength, hence to become weary or exhausted to the point of fainting. That's from Help's Word Studies. Grow weary means to become so weary that you just give up. We will reap eternal life, Paul says, if we do not become so weary that we give up. Listen, all of us become weary sometimes. The Christian life is kind of like a race, Paul says. It's a journey. It's compared to a journey in the Bible. And every, on every journey, you grow weary. You do. It's not strange in the Christian life to become weary. Have you ever become weary before? I'll tell you this. I have. Very, very weary. I've even asked myself the crazy question. The crazy question when you're living the Christian life, is this worth it? Is it worth it? Now, when I'm in my right mind, I say yes. Sometimes when you're in a really low point, you start to wonder about it. Boy, is this really worth it? Because I'm telling you, following Christ, and you already know I'm preaching to the choir, following Christ can be so difficult sometimes. Frankly, it can be exhausting and it's hard to keep in step with the Spirit and continue resisting the flesh. This is difficult to do. That's why I hate when pastors or, or anybody says, boy, if you, just, if you just believe in Jesus, your life will turn right around. You'll be happy all the time. You'll get everything that you want. It'll be smooth sailing from there. And boy, everything is just rainbows and butterflies. I'm thinking, you what? 
You said, what? What universe are you living in? You know, I'm telling you, if you think life is great all the time, uh, following Jesus, I'm just assuming that person's on the broad road to destruction. If their life is that easy, they can't be in the Spirit. Can't be. If, if, if life is just smooth and easy and carefree all the time, I'm saying, this person's on the broad road to destruction. So let me ask you this. How do we, how do we keep in step with the Spirit? How do we do this? I'm going to tell you some things right now, and I, and I want you, if you've been zoning out until this time, get zoned back in. Because this is the most important, I think this is it. What I'm about to tell you, this is the most important stuff. So if you've been like, uh, where am I in church right now? Or am I? If you're like half asleep, this is a good time to wake up. Because we need to learn from Jesus how to keep in step with the Spirit. Because you know what? You can you can keep in step with the Spirit. This is something that you can do. Every Christian can do this, but you've got to know how. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, this, these are the witnesses mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to explain all this, but I'm going to explain basically what, it, what the writer's saying. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's a few things I have to point out here. First of all, there are sins in our lives that we need to just lay aside. There are things in our lives that are an encumbrance or like an obstacle that's in our way that's preventing us from running the race like we should. I want to encourage you right now. I want to tell you right now to, to think about Anything in your life that is hindering you from running the Christian race. And you know what? Here's the trick. It doesn't even necessarily have to be sin. It can just be something you are obsessed with. I can be an obsessive person sometimes. I can become obsessed with stuff. And you know what? A lot of the time what I'm obsessed with, most of the time... It's good stuff. But you know what? When you, when you become obsessed with a good thing, it becomes a bad thing. So I want to encourage you, whatever is like taking over your life right now, whatever is like, whatever you're obsessing over right now, that's not God. <laughs> if you're obsessed with God, keep being obsessed with him. But whatever is in your life that you're obsessed with, you got to get that out of your life. You got to get that out of your life. I get obsessed with it. I mean, stuff, and you, you would think to yourself, okay, why would you be obsessed with that? And for me, it's been different forms of exercise. Now, exercise in itself is a good thing. And I would encourage you to get regular exercise. But here's the problem. When you make exercise the thing rather than just a thing, it becomes an idol. And I have had to cut certain things out of my life, certain things I was doing that, that were an idol. I used to be obsessed with weightlifting. And again, maybe you can't relate to this. Whatever. <laughs> but for me, I had to stop lifting weights because it became an obsession. Now, I found other ways to exercise. That's fine. But whatever is in your life that is an obsession for you, you need to cut that out of your life. Or at least do it in a way where it's no longer an idol. I am telling you, this is, what, this is what happens to people. This is what happens. They, they get obsessed with some good thing and then they justify their obsession by saying, what's well, a good thing though? Exercise is a good thing. Listen, exercise is a good thing until it isn't. It's a good thing until it's like, a, 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 you're, it's consuming your mind and that's all you're thinking about. Listen, 
Don't do that. Don't be deceived. There's something I had to cut out in my life just recently. And it was a good thing. But I, I had to not be obsessed with it. Okay, if you can do it and not be obsessed with it, good. If you can do it and then not think about it for the rest of the day, that's good. Keep doing it. But don't, don't let it consume your mind. So a good thing can become a bad thing if it becomes an obsession. And you're focusing on it more than you're focusing on Jesus. Get that stuff out or at least, you know, do it in a way where you're not obsessed with it. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Run the race. Now, notice what this says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. A lot of the Christian life is made a lot easier when you just focus on the fact that Jesus endured everything and he was successful. You fix your eyes on Jesus. If you're thinking, how am I going to overcome this? Then you think to yourself, Jesus overcame it. Jesus overcame it. And he was a man. Now, of course, Jesus was God and man at the same time, but Jesus was nonetheless man. You know, Jesus actually was tempted for real. The Bible says repeatedly, Jesus was tempted and he was able to overcome. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. Did you know that? So we black like, well, Jesus just, he was happy to go to the cross because he loves me. <laughs> you read the Bible and you, you get the very opposite idea. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. Now, does he love you? Of course he does. Yes, he does. Very, very much. Did he want to go to the cross? No. No. But how did he endure it? You know what he was thinking of? He was thinking of the joy set before him. The cross was temporary. The joy was everlasting. So if you're, if, if you're struggling, you know, traveling down the narrow path, if you're struggling with walking in the Spirit, you focus on what the reward is going to be in the future. And what's the reward going to be? Eternal life. Eternal life. Listen, whatever you're going through right now is not comparable to eternal life. Eternal life is what you get. Eternal life is what you're going to get out of this. Focus on that. Focus on what's ahead. Listen, whatever you got to do to conquer the sin in your life, it's worth it. I want to share something personal. I was not originally going to share this, but it kept coming into my mind, so I thought maybe God's asking me to share this. Um, I, I was on and off, but it's been fair, it's, it was consistent. On and off, I was just struggling with, with anger. And not anger at any particular thing, but just kind of anger in general. And I, I was, I'm reading the Bible and I'm going like, I, the Bible says, you can't live in anger if you're a Christian. Christians do get angry from time to time. We're not invincible, okay? We're not invincible with, when it comes to sin. But the Christian's not to live in anger. That's, that's not the way a Christian should live and that's not the way a Christian has to live. And I kept, feel, I kept getting angry, and I, and I thought, man, this is, like, this is not Christian. It, this is certainly not from the Holy Spirit. And I, I prayed, and I thought, God, I don't know how to exactly to even overcome this. And I feel kind of hypocritical, because I gave a message one time on how to overcome anger, and I wasn't overcoming anger, and I thought, God, what, what am I supposed to do about this? And there were three days in a row where fasting was brought up. Three days in a row. And someone brought it up one day, and this was completely random. Fasting almost never gets brought up in my conversations. So one day fasting was brought up, and I thought, huh, there might be something to that. The very next day it was brought up again by somebody else. They said, hey, uh, what do you think of fasting? Have you, have, you, have you tried that? So I thought, okay, someone brought it up the day before, now they're bringing it up today, and the very next day, someone else brought it up. Completely different. These people weren't talking to each other either. Now, if, someone bring, if, if three different people bring up the same thing to you randomly, and you're asking God to speak to you, then you can probably count on him speak, that he's speaking to you through these people. So I thought, well, okay, God, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to just assume that you're talking to me through these people. And I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fast. And again, I'm not, this is, this is all I did. This is, this is the extent of my fasting was I fasted one Monday and then I fasted the next Monday. Okay. I didn't fast for 40 days like Jesus. Nothing like that. My fasting was simple and it was short. Now the first day I fasted, the first Monday I fasted, I prayed throughout the day. God helped me with my anger. Now, why, why would God want us to fast? Well, one of the reasons is because when you fast, you humble yourself. And when you're humble before God, it adds strength to your prayers. That's one of the reasons. It also helps us to control ourselves. Because if you can say no to food, you can say no to other desires. So the first time I fasted, that the following week, I didn't notice a whole, big, a whole lot of difference. I didn't. Because you have to pursue something. And you can't, don't pursue it one day and give up. So the following week, I fasted again on Monday. And something was happening to me as I was doing this. I just felt the power of God stronger in my life. I just felt the power of God stronger. And I remember, I think it was the next day or the day after, I was praying, God, help me with my anger, help me with my anger. And there, there was a day, I, had, I, I just visited Don. And I was driving home from Don's house. And I just felt overwhelmingly the presence of God. Just like, like God just took one big step toward me. And the anger was gone gone. It had been gradually getting better after, this, after that second time of fasting. It had been gradually getting better. I'd been praying about it. And then all of a sudden, gone. It was like a, it was like a thousand pound weight was just lifted off my shoulders. And that's nothing I did. And see, that's, that's the thing you got to know. It's not, it's not what you do. Now, if God tells you to fast, you do it. Okay, if God tells you to fast, you do it. But it's not the fasting itself that has some magical effect. It's, it's just a way to humble yourself before God and to, to, to cry out to God, God, I can't fix this. I can't fix this in my life. And I'm, I'm asking you and I'm begging you, you, fix this for me. And then God just... He shows up and he fixes it for you through the Holy Spirit. Now listen, I'm not claiming I'm impervious to anger anymore, so don't think that, well, my battle with anger is over. I'm not saying that, but I'll tell you this. That, that, that anger that was there is not there now. It's not. I'm not saying I can't get angry again. Don't push me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying I can't get angry again, but what I'm saying is God did something there. So you got to just, whatever sin is in your life, whatever it is, there are ways of getting this out. You don't got to be stuck with the sin. You don't have to. You're never going to be impervious to sin in this life. In the next life, you will be, I think. In this life, you're not going to be impervious to sin, but there are ways you can get power from God. There are ways that God can help you overcome the sin. So don't think, oh, I'm just stuck in this. You're never, if you're a Christian, you're never stuck in any sin. Never. I don't care what the sin is. I don't care how strong the temptation is. I don't care what it is. That God's grace is sufficient to give you that power. And he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. Verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I was really humbled by this. Actually, I had read this verse. I'll just, I'll, I'm, I'm being transparent today, so I'll, be, I'll just continue because I'm on a roll. I might as well just keep rolling with it. We won't always have the opportunity to, to do good to people. Did you know that? When you get to heaven, you, you won't be able to do good to people the way that you can now. And the reason is because in heaven, there's not going to be anybody that's in want. 
Nobody's in want in heaven. Everybody has everything they need and they're always going to have it for all eternity. So here's what you have to realize. This is your chance now. This life, this is your chance to do good to people. This is it. You can't witness to anybody in heaven. You can't feed the poor in heaven. There are none. You can't help anybody in need in heaven because there is no need. You can't shine your light because everybody already is and there's, everybody already sees the light. Now is your opportunity to do as much good as you can possibly do. We need to focus our efforts on doing as much good as we possibly can while we live in this world. And I love what John Wesley said. He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Do, do good to people. And you guys, some of you guys already are. Some of you guys already are doing good right now. Keep doing that good. We must do good to all people. All people. And you know, I had read this verse and I, um, and I was sitting, I was, uh, Saturday is my day to be kind of, um, usually kind of lazy. I shouldn't say lazy. I, I was, let's just say restful because restful sounds better. But Saturday is usually my day to do that. Now, I do stuff on Saturday. I mean, I, obviously there's stuff to do sometimes. And I don't have a problem with that. But Saturdays are usually my day where I, I'm, I'm setting aside that time to take, take a break from things. And I had heard that, this was a few weeks ago, I had heard that someone was in the hospital. And I'm laying there in my, in my lazy chair. And I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do today? Maybe I'll just take it easy today. And then Galatians 6, 8 popped into my head. And 6, 9 and 6, 10. And I'm going, oh. Because I read this stuff beforehand. You know, I read, I'm reading these verses. I'm reading these verses ahead of time. Before I preach. And I'm going, I, need, I have an opportunity to do good today. And there's this battle that's going on within me. Okay, I could just take it easy today. <laughs> and the flesh is going, hey, hey, pal, you earned this. Take it easy. That person in the hospital, eh, I mean, they got family there. No big deal. This is the kind of stuff that's going on in my head. I'm, a, I'm, I'm supposed to be the pastor of the church, right? And this is the kind of stuff that's going on in my mind. This is the flesh talking. And I'm going, yeah, I could take it easy today, but there's someone in the hospital. And then these verses, like the Holy Spirit just keeps putting these verses into my mind. Okay, you need to, you have an opportunity to do good. And get this, this, may, this opportunity may never come again. So I got my lazy butt off the chair and I went to the hospital but see, here's the thing. You have no idea how many more opportunities you're going to get in this life. You have no idea how many more opportunities there's going to be. Today may be your last day to do something good for somebody else. And I want you to notice something Paul says here. And he's very specific about this. He says, you're to do good things, especially to the household of faith. Now, are we to do good to all people? Yes. But Paul says, he uses the word especially. You're to do good especially to the household of faith. Why? Because every Christian is part of your family and you're part of theirs. Every Christian. The Christianity is about being a family and loving people who are part of your family. We are a family here. Not a, not a corporation, we're a family, and we are supposed to treat each other like family. We're supposed to love each other like family because we are all a part of the spiritual family of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do good to each other. And I, I'm thankful that you guys do good to me. Um, I try and do good to you. We need to continue doing that. And here's how you, here is how you prepare for the coming of Christ. 
you prepare for the coming of Christ by loving other Christians as much as you possibly can. You love them you, by praying for them, by meeting their needs, by treating them the way you want to be treated for their benefit. You just spend as much time as you can and as much energy as you can loving other believers. And if you're doing that, if that's your goal each day, then your heart is going to be so prepared for the coming of Christ that when he comes, you're just going to rejoice and you're going to reap a harvest of eternal life and blessing and joy. And that's, that's how you prepare for the second coming of Christ. You don't prepare by buying guns and ammo so you can fight off the Antichrist and his minions. <laughs> you prepare by loving other Christians. And you keep loving them until the day you die. And when you die, Christ will welcome you into the gates of heaven saying, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You spent your life loving other believers and that's what I've asked you to do and you've done a good job. That's what you do. That's how you prepare. That's how you prepare. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13. This is what Paul prayed. This was his prayer for the Thessalonians to prepare them for the second coming of Jesus. He prayed, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. How do you prepare? Paul says, I pray that you would just be a, just loving each other all the time, that your love would increase and abound for one another. And if you do, then you're going to be blameless when Jesus comes back. How do you become blameless? And by the way, blameless doesn't mean sinless, but blameless means that your conscience is, is telling you you're doing what God wants you to do. And your conscience will tell you that all the time if you are just loving people the way Jesus did. And that's what God wants. God doesn't ask us to do anything ridiculous or unrealistic or crazy. He said, I just want you to love people the way Jesus loves. And if you're doing that, then you're going to have peace and joy all your life and you're going to be confident when Jesus comes back. And that's it. That's the main, that's, that's it. That's the main thing. So simple, so good, and so doable through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's all about walking in the Spirit. Just walk in the Spirit. God never tells us to do anything wrong. He never tells us to do anything crazy. He says, just walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Keep walking in the Spirit. And you're, gonna, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. <coughs> Father, Paul gives some warnings here. But he gives some encouragements too. And he, his, his teaching is really so clear. When we just get to the bottom of it, his teaching is so clear. It's so straightforward. And it's, the idea is, is so simplistic. We just do what the Spirit tells us to do. The Spirit tells us to love. We love. The Spirit tells us to resist anger. We resist it through his power. The Spirit tells us to love our neighbor. We love our neighbor. And sometimes that means um, calling them and encouraging them. Sometimes that means uh, giving them something that they need. Uh, whatever it is. But we, if we're doing that, if, we're, if the Spirit's telling us to do that, we do that, then we're obeying the Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit tells us to, I don't know, to, to quit thinking so much about ourselves and focus on others. We do that. Lord, if we're just doing what the Spirit tells us to do, if that's our goal, if we're doing that regularly, if we're making a habit of that, then we're walking in the Spirit, we are sowing to the Spirit, and when Christ returns, Lord, I know we're going to inherit eternal life. So, Father, help us to just to do that regularly. Help us to do that regularly. And, and Lord, if there's anything that's getting in the way, if there's any encumbrance, as Hebrews says, if there's any roadblock, if there's any 
if there's any obstacle in our way, help us to just to recognize it first and foremost, to recognize it, but then to just throw it away, to get rid of it. And if we do that, then that's, that's just one less thing we have to worry about. Help us, Lord, to, to walk in the Spirit and to get everything out of our lives that's preventing that. Father, your word is, it's, it's just, really these ideas are so simple and so basic. Help us to just take the, these things in their most basic level, to obey them, so that we can have confidence on the, on the day of judgment, Lord. And we, we can. We can through your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that for everyone here today, they came here to listen to this. Father, please cause these truths to sink into each heart. Whatever anyone needed to hear today, I pray that that, that that was heard today and that they would be blessed because of it and that they would be able to take this with them throughout the week and obey these things and become, and become the people that you want them to be. Help them, Lord. And, and Father, I pray also, whatever meaningless distractions there are in our lives right now, Whatever we're focusing on that's just not important, that's just a waste of time, if we're chasing something that's just fruitless, help us to just let it go and to focus entirely on walking in the Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.